Hello and welcome to this session on modern slavery and compliance. My name is Justine Currell and I'm a director for the modern slavery charity Unseen. I'm co-presenting today um, with Steve, Steve Farrer. Please, Steve, introduce yourself. Yeah, good morning, everybody. Uh, yeah, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, so my name is Steve Farrer. Uh, and uh, my background is briefly uh, that I, I was a compliance officer for 17 years uh, and now focus on the use of anti-money laundering to fight the proceeds from modern slavery. Back to you, Justine. Great. So, as I said, this session is about modern slavery and compliance, and I'm going to give you a view from the third sector. As I said, I'm a director for the UK modern slavery charity Unseen. I have uh, years of experience of working in government and worked on the Modern Slavery Act um, in 2015. What I want to talk to you today about is the issue of modern slavery and the impact on compliance and in particular the financial sector. Great. So when we talk about modern slavery, what are we referring to? Well, we're referring to a, a number of modern slavery crimes um, and you'll see a number of them on your screen now. So we have child exploitation, forced labour, domestic servitude, county lines, uh, sexual exploitation, human trafficking and debt bondage. They're all terms that are used to um, say what modern slavery are. But in reality, modern slavery is just abuse and exploitation of one person over another, uh, most often for profit. And unfortunately, very little chance of prosecution for the perpetrators, but horrendous human rights outcomes for the victims. And it's an area that we need to focus on, not only within the UK, but globally. This is a global issue and it affects everybody across the world. So when we talk about modern slavery, there are really four to five different typologies. The first typology is labour exploitation, forced labour. So that's many people working in so many different sectors and industries uh, across the world. Uh, we've seen so many issues uh, within the UK as well as internationally. Um, and most of that is predicated on individuals being forced to work for little or no money. What we're seeing now really though is people being um, employed legitimately in work and being exploited financially outside of the workplace. So they don't have access to their bank account or their bank card um, and for all intents and purposes are being paid legitimately by the organisation but unfortunately not seeing the benefit of the salary that's going into the bank account. And that's not just an issue in one sector or industry, we're seeing it right across the piece. So in construction, in a services sector, which includes car washes and nail bars, in food and agriculture, as well as in the whole range of hospitality takeaways um, in hotels, as well as in canteens and cleaning, for example. We also see lots of exploitation still continuing in sexual exploitation. And this is exploitation of men, uh, girls and women, as well as boys. So we see women and girls being exploited across the piece, but we're now seeing more men in situations where sexual abuse and rape is being used as a way of controlling them uh, when they're in a situation of modern slavery, possibly around labour exploitation. We're also seeing a prevalence of criminal exploitation, which clearly affects um, many people again. Um, we see uh, people being um, exploited for uh, things like drugs running, so um, they're forced to move drugs or sell drugs, um, and lots of young people are being exploited um, for that purpose. But we also see people being exploited for, um, for begging, but also shoplifting as well. And then we also see domestic servitude, so people being forced to work in private households. And unfortunately, this is very hidden, and so it's very difficult for anybody to uh, understand um, what's happening and for people to reach out and, and get help. Um, but we do see that right across the piece, um, uh, particularly across England and also within uh, the southeast of England. But that's again, again an issue that happens internationally. The other element that we don't necessarily see in the UK that 
that is prevalent in places like West Africa is organ harvesting. So people having uh, organs either forcibly removed or, or removed through coercion. Um, and unfortunately, the, the, the health implications of that and the fact that they get no money at the end of it um, is, is just the, the kind of straw that breaks the camel's back. So just to give you a bit of sense around the current landscape, because what we've seen over the past 12 months through the pandemic, we've seen a slightly different and shifting pattern in terms of modern slavery and not only our own approach, but, but the government's approach to this as well. So if you look at um, what we saw in, um, in, in the pandemic when it first hit in March 2020, uh, we actually saw a decline in the number of potential victims that were being indicated both through the helpline, but we've also seen a, a halt in the rise of numbers of potential victims uh, moving through the government's national referral mechanism. And so there was a real assumption that, um, that, that people in modern slavery wouldn't be um, very evident throughout the pandemic. Many of the uh, sectors that we would see people in have obviously been closed down for significant periods. But unfortunately, and I'll come on to this mo in a moment, we have still seen so many potential victims being indicated across the UK in 2020. Um, what we have seen though is, is a shift in how people are utilizing others how they are exploiting them. Um, and we've seen a rise in those particularly young people who are being exploited and are being forced or coerced into money laundering. So paying money into their bank account, taking a cut and moving that money on. So it's an area that we, we need to focus on. Financial exploitation um, is absolutely key. And, and we need to make sure that young people are not inadvertently caught up in this, thinking that they're doing an innocent um, activity, but in, in actual fact, they're uh, committing a criminal offence. I think the other interesting factor is around immigration rules, particularly post Brexit, we're now starting to see from the Home Office and from the government, a real clampdown on immigration um, and a different approach to managing potential victims who are being indicated um, in, in uh, the national referral mechanism, but, but potentially going into detention centres and being treated as criminals. Um, and that's something that Unseen and many other NGOs will be lobbying government about um, in the coming weeks and months. And then finally, um, thinking about Brexit, but also thinking about the, pandem the pandemic and the impact that that has had on uh, individuals who've lost their job, who may have become homeless as a result, or who may have increased uh, drink or drug problems. We need to focus on how that might impact the landscape in the UK. We know that many people are not coming to the UK uh, for the low paid, low skill jobs that they could previously uh, take up in the UK. We now have a shortage in a number of sectors. How will those shortages be filled? How will people approach and target vulnerable people who might become desperate because of their situation that has largely been driven by the pandemic and the downturn in the economy? Uh, we also have many, many individuals now reporting that they have mental health concerns. And again, that's a vulnerability that many people will target in order to make a profit off the back of them. So in terms of what we do at Unseen, we do a number of key things. Um, one of the main things that, that we, we do is we operate the UK-wide Modern Slavery and Exploitation Helpline, and we work with lots of corporates, both in the financial sector, but also in many other sectors as well, to raise awareness, to provide trend analysis, and to really provide that information about what's happening on the ground. We published our latest statistical return last week, um, which was very much around the whole of 2020 and looking at the impact of the pandemic on those that were reporting into the helpline. And as you can see, our latest published data shows that we had nearly 8,000 calls and contacts um, into the helpline in 2020, indicating 3,481 potential victims. 
Um, that is still a huge number, but it's still a drop in the ocean. And this is why uh, sessions like this and, and our wider awareness raising activities are so important to make people understand that this is actually happening on all of our high streets in all of our um, sectors and industries. And it's an area where we need to protect those that are most vulnerable to this type of exploitation. And that's why data is so key. And that's why the Modern Slavery Helpline works with the UK government, works with financial institutions, works with other sectors like the construction sector, um, as well as hospitality to really understand optimize the data that we have um, within the helpline to make sure that we can look at prevention activities. And so our data model is key and also our data standards. And we're clearly dealing with extremely sensitive data that looks at where these different types of exploitation are occurring, the typologies, the individuals that are involved, the demographics around those individuals, both whether they are indicated as potential victims or potential perpetrators. That is such a rich um, data set that we really need to maximize and utilize. And we're working with a number of partners to try and um, develop our technical capability so that we can really maximize that data and that we can provide that to all of our partners and our stakeholders to make sure that we can really genuinely work towards a world without slavery, which is Unseen's mission. So just in terms of thinking about red flag financial activity, we get a lot of these red flags being raised as part of the work that we do um, at the helpline. So when somebody contacts us and wants to report a situation, whether they're a potential victim themselves, whether that's a business, whether that's a statutory agency, or whether that's a member of the public, we're always looking for these key flags so that we can raise awareness of that and that we can provide that to the police or to the Gang Masters and Labour Abuse Authority or indeed to the National Crime Agency where there is an international dimension. So there are a number of issues that we would look at, you know, large deposits that are being made into bank accounts, patterns of card transactions that might suggest that something's happening, particularly if you have um, an individual or a business where their activity or their behaviour is changing um, and it's quite a stark change um, in that activity or behaviour. Um, we often see sudden deviations, which obviously might suggest that something um, important is happening in their life and this might be completely innocent, but also they are all very clear indications that something um, uh, afoot uh, could, could be afoot in terms of uh, criminal activity. Um, we also see particularly around issues relating to sexual exploitation where large deposits of cash are going into bank accounts and are being almost withdrawn immediately, uh, large expenses for food and accommodation, uh, use of virtual currencies are being indicated to us at the helpline, um, but also wages being deposited into account and then quickly withdrawn or transferred. So it appears that um, individuals are maybe having to move that money onto a third party. As I said, all of these red flag financial activities may be completely innocent and may indicate the particular way in which a, a, an individual wants to um, use their own money um, and access their own money, but it's also something that we should be very much aware of. And so coming on to compliance versus continuous improvement, um, as I mentioned earlier, as part of the work that I undertook as a senior policy advisor in the Home Office, um, the idea of Section 54 and requiring businesses to report on what they were doing on a year-on-year year -year basis was very much around that continuous improvement dimension. Um, compliance is absolutely important. Compliance with uh, the Act, compliance with policies and protocols and procedures, but actually compliance in one way or another can um, result in a tick box exercise. And so it's absolutely key that we look at continuous improvement. How do we keep moving the dial? How do we make sure that we're not just uh, reporting on our activities at that moment in time and that we don't worry about it until another 12 months later? And so looking at all of the activities that we undertake through a continuous improvement lens 
understanding how that impacts our own business and how that impacts the individuals that we either work with through our suppliers or subcontractors, but also through our customers and clients is fundamental. One of the areas that we've identified as being very key in terms of modern slavery is around the investment community and the investment community are very much now uh, looking at ESG and, and the people element of the ESG agenda and really making sure that uh, people are put at the heart of decisions um, opportunities and also policies and processes that businesses take forward to make sure that we do genuinely mitigate and prevent people from being exploited. So just to give you a brief view around how we work with businesses, we, we have a number of things that we do. Um, I mentioned the Modern Slavery Helpline data previously, and um, that's absolutely key for us. Um, data is powerful, but it's only powerful if you utilize it to best effect. We believe that by uh, sharing our data and information with uh, strategic partners like the Home Office, like the rest of government, like policing, but also our corporate partners, those businesses on the front line who are making decisions day in, day out, um, that's absolutely critical. So when we get calls and contacts in about labour exploitation or labour abuse cases, we will post them to a portal. It's only situational information. Um, uh, information about individuals is never provided, but that gives businesses an opportunity to understand where their hotspots are, where those trends are occurring, um, and where they may, may need to put in additional, additional safeguards to prevent people from being exploited. We also provide consultancy, so gap analysis and strategy support is absolutely key. This is not an issue that can be resolved in six or 12 months. It's a five year or 10 year roadmap and strategy that allows businesses to really understand what they're doing um, to, to both prevent and mitigate it, but also to ensure that they're continuously improving and moving forward. As we've seen through the pandemic with the with the rise in money laundering, you know, these perpetrators are uh, criminals who are utilizing business practices to make a profit off the back of others. And so they will change their modus operandi if it means that they can make uh, more money out of, of an individual. And, and then we provide training. Raising awareness is absolutely key. So training everybody within an organization, um, you know, from, from grassroots to, to the C-suite, it's absolutely vital that everybody understands why we're doing this, understands that we have people at the, the heart of what we're talking about. This is not about policy and processes. They are a means to ensuring that the individuals are not exploited unnecessarily. So in terms of what can you do, what can we all do? Well, I think you need to have that professional curiosity. When something doesn't feel right, ask yourself why. Um, quite often, if it doesn't feel right, um, then it, it some you know something probably isn't right, and so you need to be um, very aware of of that and and act on it. Um, I think keeping an open mind is absolutely key, and asking the right questions at the right times. Um, training plays a very key part in understanding the signs and how you can spot them and then knowing what you can do when you've got a particular issue, how you deal with it, making sure that you don't just jump in with both feet, because sometimes if you do that, then you can actually put uh, yourself or somebody else at risk. So always getting advice and guidance around uh, a particular issue is key know who to contact, so that's very important. Having the right escalation policy and procedures in place and, and that resulting remediation um, is really key. Um, if you escalate it in the right process, everybody's clear about that escalation process, then you feel more confident about what you're doing. Um, and it's really critical um, that we move that through and that we have the right data um, and intelligence to make sure that activities can take place as, as a result of that intelligence and that we actually learn from that and we move forward and ultimately um, we can improve and strengthen our prevention activities. 
Um, and I think one thought that I wanted to leave you with was around the UK's uh, independent anti-slavery commissioner who um, produced a report recently around the financial sector and basically said that 36% of financial uh, industry employees don't really see crimes of human trafficking, modern slavery as relevant to their business, which I think is pretty shocking when you think about the whole premise of modern slavery and exploitation that we've talked about is very much around making money um, and really making the profit off the back of somebody else. So we really need to do, we really need to raise that awareness. We really need to make sure that we, we know the flags, we know the indicators, and we know what to do if we spot those signs. Thank you very much for listening to me. Um, you'll see my contact details there. I'm more than happy to um, have a, a wider conversation with you if you feel that that is appropriate. But I'd now like to hand over to Steve Farrow who will take us through uh, the second part of the session. Thank you. Well, many thanks, uh, Justine. That was fantastic and a really uh, um, great way to introduce the topic. So uh, I much appreciate it. So, ladies and gentlemen, we're just going to continue that. Uh, I'd just like to thank um, Bureau Van Dyke as well for arranging this session on modern slavery. Uh, and it's a great pleasure to be uh, sharing the platform with Justine. Um, I, I, you know, I'm always in awe of the work that Unseen do, uh, especially around running the uh, Modern Slavery Helpline. So uh, uh, I, I would strongly encourage you to go and find out more about their fantastic work and especially that download that report that uh, Justine mentioned, because uh, that is a source of gold in terms of intelligence for banks uh, about red flag indicators and trends. So um, I'm gonna take a slightly different tack here. I'm gonna talk about money. Um, and uh, really, you know, these figures here are, are, are shocking. You know, if we talk around 40 million uh, men, women, boys and girls trapped in modern slavery, uh, generating uh, this is an old number as well, 150 billion US dollars a year from their, their, their hard work, their backbreak, their, their heartache. Uh, and that makes it the third largest crime in the world uh, in terms of revenue uh, behind counterfeiting and drug trafficking. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, you know, this is where financial services play a key role. Uh, and I believe that, uh, you know, you are the new heroes in the fight because you are the ones that can see this money uh, in the system. So I'm just going to play you a quick video uh, and this comes from Canada that shows how effective financial institutions can be working in partnership with uh, NGOs and with law enforcement. They always told us if we leave, they'll beat us till we are black and blue. And they will, they will put our body in a black garbage bag. And then they put our body in the Lake Ontario and no one will ever know what happened to us. Good Lord, this could have helped in so many investigations. That's black and white evidence right there that the victim is making the money, but she's not spending it on herself.
So ladies and gentlemen, uh, I hope you found that interesting. That really basically uh, completely complements what Justine was saying about uh, the understanding of red flags from uh, charities working with victims to see how did it operate uh, and taking that information then into banks uh, and helping them to refine their systems to look for this activity, uh, make the reports. Now, this comes from an operation called Project Protect in Canada, uh, and this has changed the way they fight financial uh, activity against human trafficking. Uh, the number of suspicious uh, transaction reports has rocketed through the roof, uh, and they are very good quality now. Uh, and it's leading to a lot of arrest cases, both across Canada and internationally, uh, of human trafficking syndicates. So this works, ladies and gentlemen. It works, and it works very, very well. Uh, and that's why we're delighted to be talking to you today. I'd just like to show you another quick movie. Um, and this is really about businesses involved in human trafficking. Often we talk about uh, sex trafficking, uh, and that gets a lot of attention, but there are lots of uh, victims trapped, uh, as Justine mentioned, in construction uh, and other industries. And this one talks about the fishing industry. So again, it's a quick one, uh, and it will just highlight some of the issues that you may wish to consider. Actually, this uh, video is, is based on a, a, some research that my team did. Uh, and we put this together, really looking not just at the, uh, the human trafficking risk, but also the banking risk. So uh, in there, you would have seen a diagram of uh, a, a map of, of companies that are involved in various parts of the process. Uh, recruitment of, of people into the situation, uh, the actual fishing boats uh, where the slavery was committed. But then there are a whole network of logistics uh, and other companies uh, that help refuel the boats, that help process the fish. Uh, and these are also all involved uh, across many countries uh, in uh, handling the proceeds or products of, of human trafficking. And so from a banking uh, perspective, there are four risks that you may face uh, from slavery. Now, obviously, there's a direct risk that one of your clients is involved actively in either recruiting or using uh, victims of forced labor. Uh, and then you have an indirect risk of where your client uh, is actually one of the logistics firms or processing firms uh, handling the proceeds, handling the products from it. Uh, thirdly, there's the correspondent banking risk. If you work for a large bank, uh, you may have correspondent banking relationships with banks in jurisdictions that are a uh, high risk of being involved. Uh, but you then take on their risk uh, because of your correspondent relationship. Uh, and lastly, you, you may be a, a large bank involved in US dollar clearing. Uh, which is the processing of US dollar transactions. And again, you may be getting funds coming in uh, from uh, a group or an organization uh, that have been involved directly with slavery. 
uh, and you are now handling it. So th these are the four key risks to financial institutions from uh, organized human trafficking, forced labor. Now, there have some, been some monumental changes in the last five years about the use of anti-money laundering uh, framework. Uh, and this uh, UN Security Council Resolution 2331 in 2016 uh, was one of the first times the UN Security Council directed the Financial Action Task Force who set the global uh, rules on, on anti-money laundering to look at financial flows associated with human trafficking. And because of that, the Financial Action Task Force took on a project uh, to actually uh, look again at financial flows from human trafficking. And I'm showing you on the screen now, on the left is um, the predicate offenses uh, that are in most countries are, are anti-money laundering laws uh, designed against these offenses. Um, so the trafficking in human beings and migrant smuggling is, is one of those predicate offences that you should be uh, looking for. On the right is a landmark document from the Financial Action Task Force, Financial Flows from Human Trafficking. It's an excellent document um, and it has a lot of ideas there about different typologies, different methods. Uh, and I would strongly encourage you as a compliance professional to download that and, and have a look through it. Uh, and see what you can use at, from that. I'm going to change uh, tack again, uh, and now I'm going to just in the next few slides give you a few ideas of resources that are out there to help you. Um, so the first one is, is your risk assessments, your country uh, risk assessment and industry risk assessment. Um, for country risk, there are three resources you may wish to consider. The US State Department Trafficking in Persons Index which risk ranks countries all around the world uh, on their risk of being involved in, in human trafficking. So tier one is, is low risk all the way up to tier three, which is high risk. Uh, there is a separate uh, source of, of, of country risk from the Walk Free Global Slavery Index, uh, which again goes by country to give a risk ranking. So these are the kinds of things that if you're tasked or you have a team uh, building a risk assessment, uh, then you should consider to include the risk of uh, forced labor, human trafficking uh, into that. On the right hand side is uh, product lists. Uh, one of the most famous ones is from the US Department of Labor, their list of products produced by child labor, a list of products produced by forced labor. So again, you can download this list uh, and perhaps look uh, into it about your footprint, where you operate, in which countries, uh, and do you uh, handle any clients in any of these industries? And perhaps you might want to uh, change your risk ratings for those industries and those clients. Uh, something recently that you should be mindful of as well is the US uh, Customs and Border Protection have started to reuse um, a provision which is called the Withhold Release Orders and Findings. Um, so basically there, if allegations of uh, use of forced labor are made to the US Customs and Border Protection, um, they will look into it. If they think there is a merit to that allegation, they will then ban the import of that product from either that country or from that company. Uh, and they've started doing this on, on a very major product called palm oil. Uh, and I just give you two examples there where uh, the US has now banned the import of palm oil from Malaysia from two major multinational providers, um, which really is <laughs> very damaging to their business, I would suggest. Um, but, you know, there are allegations of forced labor on plantations, which I believe are being addressed. Uh, but this is a way that the US uh, are using uh, their their provisions, their laws to, to take action. Uh, and so I think as a compliance professional, you should go and have a look at this. Uh, there are several countries listed there uh, and they've really uh, supercharged the use of this recently. Uh, and if you're dealing uh, in US dollars or you're dealing with the US, uh, you would need to be mindful of what is being placed on this list. Now back uh, 
what else can you do? Well, many banking professionals use uh, adverse media um, to be an early warning of risk. Uh, so uh, we have developed a, another partner organization, uh, the Mekong Club, uh, provide this, uh, a list of adverse media slavery keywords. So you may wish to consider this, these keywords uh, around uh, slavery into your adverse media uh, strategy. You may be using a third party solution provider. Uh, and again, ask them to include the adverse media keywords. Um, and you may also be using a, a database vendor. Uh, again, ask them what are they doing to cover uh, human trafficking, forced labor? You know, what is their content? What is their approach? Uh, and uh, are they doing it correctly? Uh, and then again, in the UK, um, I would strongly suggest you use a resource like the uh, TISC report to have a look at clients. Do they have a modern slavery act statement? Uh, how current is it? Um, is it up to, to date? Um, or is it just a cut and paste job? Uh, so these are things that you can do in the scope of your work uh, as compliance professionals, and they can make a difference. Um, I just wanted to give you an example here. Um, so our RDC is now part of the uh, Bureau Van Dyke uh, business. Uh, but the, in 2019, they made a press uh, release to say that they, in partnership with my, my former organization, Liberty Shared, uh, had put 12,000 names of uh, suspects involved in uh, human trafficking uh, into their database. And this is the kind of things that, that need to happen, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, so you need providers there who are focusing on this issue uh, and helping you to identify risk. Um, if you want to look at that 12,000 names, you can actually still go to the Liberty Shared uh, website uh, and you can follow the link and they will show you the database uh, there and you can use that yourselves. Uh, something else you can do uh, is also looking for red flags. Uh, and Justine mentioned the value uh, that the uh, Modern Slavery Helpline have in being able to identify new red flags uh, from victims, uh, from their experience. So again, there are various sources by government agencies, uh, the US FinCEN uh, has produced them, uh, the Canadians have produced them, uh, also here the NCA has produced them. Um, so these again are great to, to look at these red flags and see if you can incorporate those into your uh, monitoring strategies, uh, your, your surveillance strategies. Uh, and there are typologies. So uh, a number of groups have put out typologies uh, of what does modern slavery look like. Uh, they have been put out in Europe, uh, in Asia Pacific, in the US. Um, and again, they, they have some local uh, regional nuance. So not one size fits all. Um, but uh, these, again, are very helpful for you to customize uh, both your uh, surveillance strategies, but also use them in staff training as well. Um, they can be very helpful. Uh, and finally, uh, I would just like to use this quote from William Wilberforce, who is the sort of founder of the uh, stopping old slavery, uh, former slavery. And it says you may choose to look the other way, but you can never again, again say you did not know. Uh, and, you know, I, we hope that uh, this brief session today has given you an insight of the problem of things that you can do to, to make a difference uh, from your desktop, things that you can change in your daily practices uh, to, to bring more focus on uh, suspicious activity linked to, to human trafficking and forced labor. Uh, and we'd strongly encourage you to, as well, uh, I've done it myself, is do a learn at lunch uh, buy some sandwiches, get your colleagues you know, in the conference room over lunch uh, and go through some of these things that we've shared today. Uh, we'd be delighted to make those available. Um, as uh, Justine said, Unseen uh, are very happy to help you. Um, and of course, uh, our, my slide deck and I'm sure Justine's will be available to you uh, so you can see those resources as well. Um, but we really hope this can help you both personally and professionally uh, to help join in the fight against slavery, because we all need to take a, a responsibility in this. On that note, uh, I will pause and stop, uh, hand the floor back to, to Justine. Thank you very much again for listening to me.
great thanks steve um so now we'd like to um take some questions so um we've had a, a few questions coming through and so just just posing this first question steve really um around what more is being done both um from the international community um as well as uh, within the uk to to really combat the crime of modern slavery well, that's a really good question, <laughs> uh, and I'd welcome your thoughts on that as well, Justine. Um, I, I think a lot has been done, uh, uh, and which is really positive. Uh, as I mentioned, some of the the uh, compliance changes and the attitude and approaches, especially of banks, has changed in the last five years. It's done a complete 180. Um, so you've seen uh, now a lot of banks um, have uh, you know appointed even uh, directors of fighting modern slavery or teams to do it, uh, and, and I, I, that really is encouraging. I, I think the fact though is that um, uh, so much more needs to be done, and it's not just uh, us saying that, ladies and gentlemen. If you go to the U.S. Trafficking in Persons report every year, it produces a, a sort of a scorecard of how well we're doing globally, uh, and I think. Uh, and, and I may be wrong, but I think in 2019, we only globally rescued 105,000 uh, um, uh, victims of, of, of slavery and prosecuted, I think, about 10,000 traffickers. You know, and, and if you go to those figures we shared earlier, saying, well, there are 24.5 million people trapped as we're talking, you know, a lot more needs to be done. So. I, I think there's been a lot of positive things um, that I've seen, uh, especially in the financial sector. But, you know, the figures still show that we've got, uh, you know, a huge mountain to climb. Uh, what, what sort of views would you have it? Because you, you have a great perspective on this as well. Yeah, and I think, you know, um, really, in, in one way, the, the UK government kicked off the, the kind of international um recognition around you know modern slavery and 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 the, the typologies and as you've mentioned in your uh, presentation steve um I, I think there will be more coming down the track i think um as, as you just mentioned prosecution numbers are, are woefully inadequate you know and and that's probably just relating to the the handful in the uk as well as a handful in other countries elsewhere um, obviously, the UK government's looking at strengthening the Modern Slavery Act, uh, potentially Section 54. They've just introduced a central registry and then we'll start to um, require businesses to include some mandatory aspects within their, within their statements, which I think is all a step in the right direction. We've got mandatory human rights due diligence being looked at very closely in the EU, and we've got other um, international counterparts in places like Australia, Canada, the US are continue to look at this as well as New Zealand. So um, I think we're going in the right direction. We've got to remember collaboration and partnership. We've got to remember that the data needs to really work for us. Um, and if we do that, then we can really start to make the whole globe intolerant to what is, for all intents and purposes, uh, an abhorrent crime that's, that's metered out on those that are most vulnerable in our societies. So um, yeah, we're moving in the right direction, but much more to do. Fantastic. We, we've been given another question here. Maybe I can pose it to you this time, Justine. Um, <laughs> what, what can compliance pre professionals do more of, uh, do you think, in, in the fight against modern slavery? I mean, we've shared some tips already, but is there anything else you could uh, encourage them? Uh, those that have asked yeah, and maybe at reiterating some of those points I mean really keeping an open mind um, it's surprising how many um, businesses um, are saying they're taking action but actually the, on the surface look like they are but are not really embedding this appropriately so I think compliance officers need to be open and aware of how uh, modern slavery and financial exploitation in particular can infiltrate um, how it manifests and then really having that strong escalation route so knowing what to do with the information um, that professional curiosity I can't stress enough uh, just delving into um, the, you know the data and the information I think is absolutely critical but once you've done that it's then knowing what to do with it so making sure you've got those strong processes in place I think um, is critical and the whole 
um, you know, sector and then um, wider communities need to come together to really make sure that we're not kind of missing a trick, that we're not you know it's a bit like a whack-a-mole you hit it in one area and and it pops up somewhere else and this is what we were talking about in terms of the the dynamics of um organized crime groups which quite often are behind uh, much of the exploitation that we see so it's really about making sure that we keep our eye on the ball and we're constantly moving forward constantly improving and looking for that next opportunity to um in incorporate prevention activities Fantastic. No, thank you very much for that. Um, I guess I think we've got time for just one more question. I see we're coming up to the towards the the end of it. Um, you know, what? Why do you think follow the money? You know, is this strategy? Is it going to work in modern slavery? Uh, what, any thoughts on that? Um, well, I'll give my thoughts, but I think you are also uh, probably have uh, lots to say in this area, Steve. Um, follow the money. Why? Because this is all about making money. This is all about making money off the back of other people. Um, and we always look for those physical signs. You know, so it's always about the individual, the person, how do they present their behavior, their attitude, but actually it goes much deeper than that. What about their activities? Um, and we all leave a financial trail. Um, and when you start to see patterns of behavior, patterns of financial transactions, um, patterns of movement, location, you know, all of that can build that story, can build that um that that ability to really investigate and i think that's the unlocking of all of this i think what was really important in bringing the modern slavery act into play was the the tools around asset seizure you know if, if this is all about money we should go after the money we should go after it and take it away from those who are trying to make it off the back of of those that are more vulnerable so for me it's it's absolutely critical what's your view steve <laughs> I think you've said it perfectly, actually. <laughs> so well done. But uh, no, I completely agree with you. And I, I, I think I just want to um, add the point that uh, the traffickers, the smugglers, um, they are, uh, you know, making an awful lot of money uh, out of poor and vulnerable people. Uh, and, you know, they are funding a criminal lifestyle, be it as a network of, of you know, as an organized crime network or even as individuals. Uh, and this really, you know, that uh, I was told that in many capital cities that the price of property, luxury property is going up. And it's not because of local people. It's because of, you know, foreigners coming in. Uh, and I would suspect that, that the many of those are the proceeds from things like human trafficking. Um, so I think this is why uh, financial uh, institutions and compliance professionals especially have a key role because you do see uh, the money, you do see suspicious activity, uh, and by reporting it, uh, both you can stop it in your own institution and protect yourselves, but also by reporting it, it goes through to inform law enforcement to the FIU, uh, and they can take action as well. So I, uh, I you know, I think... Um, what you were sharing, Justine, before about, you know, the intelligence, the data coming out of your work uh, and hopefully the, the videos that I shared can show that this can work and work very, very well. So I would just like to sort of end my bit there, get off my soapbox and just say, look, uh, you know, please, uh, as compliance professionals, please add your skills uh, and your professional capabilities into the fight. You're most welcome uh, and you're most needed. Uh, so that would be my closing comment. And I'll I'll hand back to you. And, and a fabulous comment to end on, Steve. Um, thank you very much for uh, your contribution today. As ever, it's been um, very insightful. And thanks everybody for listening to us. If you do or would like any further help or support, please do uh, contact either myself or Steve. Um, as Steve said, more than happy for you to have uh, the slides from this session today um, but please keep your eyes and ears open and, and act if you think that you see something suspicious thank you very much for your time um, and have a good day thank you <laughs>